In this lecture, I'm going to introduce the concept of a frequency response. All the analysis we have done up to this point were in the time domain. And now we are going to study how the system behaves in the frequency domain. That is, the input to the system is now a sinusoidal waveform. In a steady state, sinusoidal inputs to a linear system generate sinusoidal responses of the same frequency. Even though these responses are of the same frequency as the input, they differ in amplitude and phase angle from the input. These differences are functions of the frequency. The Bode plot is simply a graphic representation of the frequency response of a system for a wide range of input frequencies. In this lecture, we are going to see the basics of Bode plots, and in the next lecture, we are going to expand that to more complex cases. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to understand the concept of frequency response, determine the magnitude and phase of a transfer function, and represent the magnitude and phase of a transfer function in a Bode plot for a given range of frequencies. There are many applications of frequency response. In fact, most of the industrial designs and control systems use frequency response rather than time response. The reason being that frequency response allows one to calculate the transfer function of an unknown system by simply subjecting that system to a sinusoidal input waveform of different frequencies, and then watch the output. By then comparing the output and the input, we can infer the transfer function of that unknown system. This is one example where we have an unknown system, G of S. We give to the system a sinusoidal waveform of various frequencies and we watch the output of that system. We can then plot this output for a range of frequencies and see how the magnitude and the phase of the output will change when the frequency changes. And based on this graph, we should be able to infer the function g of s without any prior model for g of s. Frequency response analysis has also many applications in other fields. Here is one example. I encourage you to click on this link and watch this video first. You can see that this imposing bridge is collapsing because of the wind. What is making the bridge collapse here is not necessarily the intensity of the wind, but actually the frequency of vibrations induced by the wind. It turns out that the wind makes this structure vibrate at the resonance frequency. And you know that at particular point in the resonance frequency, the amplitude of these vibrations are the highest. It doesn't take a lot of energy to destroy the bridge, what it takes is the right frequency excitation, where the magnitude of the output is the highest. This is a known problem in civil engineering design. Industrial design of control systems is accomplished using frequency response methods more often than any other method. The reason is exactly what we discussed before. We give a system a input as a sinusoidal waveform, we pass that function through a linear process G of S, and we watch the phase and magnitude of the output signal. And all this can be done experimentally. With this information, raw measurements of the output are sufficient to infer G of S and to design a control system to control that process G of S. There is no need to know the dynamic model of the system. You may be wondering why are we now studying systems using a sinusoidal waveform? Well, we know that the function G of S is a linear system. If G of S is a linear system, it can be built using only four basic operations. Subtraction, integration, derivation, and summation. If we now take a sinusoidal waveform and pass that sinusoidal waveform through a combination, any combination of these four operations, the output is also a sinusoidal waveform of the same frequency. The sinusoidal waveform is the only cyclic waveform that when subjected to a combination of these four operations will not change shape. The output of a linear system subjected to a sinusoidal waveform is a sinusoidal waveform and is a sinusoidal waveform of the same frequency. And that's why frequency response analysis always uses sinusoidal waveforms. The only thing that I can change in this process is the phase and the magnitude of the output signal. By magnitude, we mean the height of the input waveform and the height of the output waveform. And by phase, we mean the delay between the input and the output waveform or the temporal shift between them. In this example, we are going to study the temporal response of function g of s to a sinusoidal input signal. If the process is g of s and the input is u, the output is y, we can now relate the input and output using the simple transfer function defined in 1, where u of t is a sine wave with amplitude a. We can now define u of t as in equation 2, a is the amplitude, and omega 0 is the frequency in radians per second. If you now take the Laplace transform of this input signal, we get u of s, which is a times omega 0 divided by s squared plus omega 0 squared. Now that we have defined the input in the frequency domain, we can determine the output using equation 3. This is simply the transfer function multiplied 
by the input signal. We are considering a steady state, which means that all transients in this analysis are neglected. We are now tasked with finding the inverse of equation 4. Clearly, this requires partial fraction expansion. The solution to 4 takes the form of 5, where we have a combination of different polynomials with real and imaginary poles. Alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n to alpha 0 are simply constants that are to be found using the partial fraction decomposition. Once we find the constants alpha, we can now find the inverse of equation 5 and find the temporal response of the system as given in equation 6. We notice two interesting things. The first one is that we have terms that have real poles and these will give rise to exponential waveforms. We can also notice terms that have complex poles and this will give rise to sinusoidal waveforms. Thus our time response has two components, sinusoidal waveforms and exponential waveforms. What is the steady state response? Provided that a P1, P2 and Pn are negative numbers, that is all real poles are on the left side of the S-plane, all these exponentials will eventually die out to zero and we are left with the last term. In a steady state, the sinusoidal component is the only component left. And under these conditions, under the assumption that the system is stable, the output of our system simplifies to the sinusoidal terms only, which in this case is simply this one, and this is the output of the system. This is the output in a steady state. In this example here, we notice two interesting things. The first one is that as I stated before, the output has the same frequency as the input but now the output has a phase shift. We can also see that the magnitude of the sinusoidal waveform has changed compared to the input. It is easy to prove that equation 9 can be written as in equation 10. In equation 10, the magnitude of the output signal is given as A times M. A, if you recall, is the magnitude of the input signal, as defined earlier here, and M is the magnitude of the transfer function at the input frequency. The transfer function g of s can be split into a real and imaginary part. Now taking the square root of the imaginary part squared plus the real part squared, as shown here, gives the magnitude of that transfer function for the input frequency omega zero. In this case, we simply replace s equals to j omega zero. Even more interestingly is that the phase shift that we see is simply the phase of the transfer function itself at the input frequency which is the arctangent of the imaginary part of the transfer function evaluated at that frequency divided by the real part. Now it is important to define what we mean by magnitude of the transfer function. If you now take the function g of s and replace s with j omega, we can split the transfer function or decompose the transfer function into its real and imaginary parts. And we can now plot that into a imaginary and real axis you see this is like a vector representation and if you put this representation in the S plane, in the real and imaginary axis, we can locate the real part and we can locate the imaginary part. This creates a vector in the S plane whose magnitude is the magnitude of the transfer function. The magnitude is given here. The phase of the transfer function is simply this angle, which can be calculated as the inverse tangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part. We see that both the magnitude and the phase are functions of the excitation frequency omega zero. If we change omega zero, both frequency and magnitude of the output signal will change. Notice that in the above, s equals to j omega. What happens to sigma? Since lecture three, we have defined s as sigma plus j omega. What happens to sigma here? Now remember that we are dealing with the steady state analysis of the system. This means that we neglected all transients. The transients in this case, as we saw before, came from all exponential components. If we are no longer interested in the exponential components or the transients, we can simply set sigma to zero. And that's why in frequency domain, sigma is always zero, s now becomes j omega. Here we have the same function we calculated in the steady state, but here we have the actual response of the system, including all components, including even the transient. We see the transient response decaying to zero and leaving behind the sinusoidal component that oscillates indefinitely. And after the exponential decay to zero, this is now the steady state response of the system. And this is what we are concerned with in frequency analysis. Again, S now becomes J omega 
and hereafter sigma will be zero. Let's try to understand these concepts a bit better by looking at a numerical example. Here we have a system given by this block diagram. The input to our system is x of t, which is defined here. It's simply a sinusoidal waveform of magnitude 1 and a frequency of 0.5 radians per second. We're going to pass this signal through our system here and look at the output y of t. We have two branches. One is a branch that goes through a gain of 2. And the other branch is the integration of the input signal. We now add them up and you get the output y of t. In the Laplace domain, the integration now becomes 1 over s. And this is the same representation, but now in the frequency domain. We are now able to find an expression for y of t. Here it is. It is simply 2 times x of t plus the integral of x of t. x of t is sine of 0.5t. By now solving for the integration, we have negative 2 cosine of 0.5t. And using a trigonometric identity that is given there, we can now simplify this expression into one single term as given here. What do we notice? The output of our system again has the same shape, that is, is a sinusoidal waveform, has the same frequency at the, as the input, that is 0.5 radians per second. But now two things have changed. The first one is the magnitude of the output, which is now 2 square root of 2. Another thing that has changed is the phase of the transfer function. It's now shifted by 0.785 radians. According to the analysis we did before, if we are correct, 2 square root of 2 must be the magnitude of the transfer function included in this block when the frequency is 0.5 radians per second. And this phase shift must be the phase of g of s for that very same frequency. So now let's verify if this assumption is correct. We can now look at the frequency domain and find the transfer function. The transfer function for our system is very simple. It's 2 plus 1 over s, which gives 2s plus 1 over s. This is the transfer function of our system. If you now wish to evaluate the phase and the magnitude of that transfer function at the input frequency, we now make s equals to j omega, where omega in this case is 0.5. So s equals to 0.5j. And you can now replace that into the transfer function. The result is shown here. To eliminate that a complex number in the denominator, we can simply multiply both the numerator and the denominator by j. This gives the real part of the transfer function s2. And if you look at this term, we have, we have 1 over 0 0.5, that is 2, times j. And in the denominator, we have j times j, that is j squared. j squared is negative 1. So this is equal to negative 2j. And here we have the imaginary part of our transfer function. Having the real part and the imaginary part of the transfer function allows us to calculate the magnitude. The magnitude is simply the real part squared plus the imaginary part is squared, square root of all that. And this gives 2 square root of 2, which is exactly what we found in the previous slide. We can also evaluate the phase of the transfer function as the inverse tangent of the imaginary part, negative 2, divided by the real part, which is 2. Tangent minus 1 of negative 1 is 0 0.785 radians. Again, exactly what we found in the previous slide. So our assumption holds. If you wish to evaluate the output of a linear system when subjected to a sinusoidal waveform input, simply look at the magnitude of the transfer function for the frequency of excitation. That will give an indication of the change in magnitude and phase of the output compared to the input. Now the analysis we did was for a single frequency. That frequency was 0.5 radians per second. Most often this is not sufficient. We want to evaluate the system at a wide range of frequencies. We can now keep this analysis generic and simply replace s with j omega and give a range to omega and now evaluate the phase and magnitude of the system for that range. Now let's concentrate in our transfer function here. We can now plot the imaginary and the real part of the transfer function in the s plane. The real part of this transfer function is equal to 2 for all frequencies. It's frequency independent. We can now place number 2 here. And this is the real part of our transfer function. However, the imaginary part of the transfer function is frequency dependent, is negative 1 over omega. Thus, we can place the imaginary part here. The magnitude of the transfer function is the magnitude of this vector. And the phase of the transfer function is simply this angle. We can now see that the phase and magnitude will depend on the frequency. 
the change in the output signal, the response of the system will now change depending on the frequency of excitation. What happens, for example, if the frequency tends to zero? If the frequency tends to zero, then this term will tend to infinity and this line will shift down and tend to negative infinity. This means that the magnitude of the transfer function will tend to infinity. What is the phase of the transfer function in that case? If again this line tends to negative infinity, then this vector will grow downwards and now the phase will tend to negative 90 degrees. Now what happens if the frequency tends to infinity? What happens to the magnitude? 1 over a very large number will tend to 0. Now this line will shift towards the real axis, which means that the magnitude will tend to 2. The real part is always 2, but the imaginary part will now tend to 0. What happens to the phase? Well, if the line again tends to the real axis, then that angle decreases as the line goes up. Thus, the phase will tend to 0 degrees. And here we have a complete representation of the behavior of the system. The magnitude of the output signal will tend to 2 as the frequency tends to infinity. If the frequency tends to 0, then the magnitude of the output signal will also tend to infinity. Now we can take the same concept, but represent the phase and magnitude in a easier to see format. We can now have two plots, one for the phase and one for the magnitude as a function of the frequency. And here it is. We have our transfer function. We are now changing the frequency and evaluating the real and imaginary part of the transfer function, calculating the magnitude and calculating the phase in the same way we did in the previous slide. And now we can plot it here. The first plot represents the magnitude of the transfer function. The second plot represents the phase of the transfer function. And the horizontal axis is the frequency of excitation. Now there is a small difference here. You notice that the magnitude is expressed in a log scale, is expressed in decibels. To make it easier to see, and because of some weird history in control systems, the magnitude is all expressed as 20 log of the magnitude of the transfer function. So we find the magnitude of the transfer function, take 20 log of that, and then plot it on the graph. Using a log scale will make it a lot easier to see changes in the magnitude of the transfer function. We still see here a problem is that in this part of the graph we have a sudden change in the magnitude but then it tends to a constant value. But all information we want is here. And the reason is that the frequency here is in a regular scale. We're now going to use the frequency axis also in a log scale. And here is the final representation. We have the magnitude of the transfer function as 20 log of the actual magnitude. We have the phase in degrees and you now have the frequency also in a log scale. But this is not multiplied by 20. This is not in decibels. This is simply log 10 of the frequency. So here we have decibels and here we have log 10. And this is degrees. If you now take a frequency here of zero, frequency of zero doesn't exist, but remember that this is the result of log of the frequency, which in this case is zero, so the frequency here is one radians per second. Log 10 of one is zero. If you now take this point, this point was found through log of omega equals to one. Omega equals to 10 to the power of one. Omega is actually 10 radians per second at that point. So these, uh, these elements here represent the powers of 10 in the frequency. And this is what we call a Bode plot, a picture of the frequency response of the system for a given range of frequencies. The magnitude is expressed in decibels, and the magnitude is always shown as 20 log of the magnitude of the transfer function. Remember that. This is called the gain of the transfer function, and the other plot will be called the phase of the transfer function. Now, if you want to know the exact magnitude of the transfer function in a non-log scale, say at that point, and let's assume that at this point the magnitude is 20 decibels, we know that we got 20 through the operation 20 log of the magnitude that I'm going to call here A, and this is equal to 20 at that specific point. So now we have log of A equals to 1, which means that A equals to 10 to the power of 1, and A equals to 10. This is the actual magnitude of the transfer function. Now if you take 20 log of 10, log 10 of 10 is 1, so this gives 20, which is the value we have there. 
There is another immediate benefit of using a log function to express the magnitude of the transfer function. Using the log scale will allow us to draw the transfer function using approximations of straight lines or combination of straight lines. We know that a transfer function is defined as a ratio of polynomials. In this case, we have zeros and poles, zeros zi and poles pi. We have a combination of different poles and zeros, and we have a gain k that multiplies that transfer function. We want to express the magnitude of this transfer function. We want to express the magnitude of this transfer function in a log scale, which means taking 20 log of the magnitude of g of s. We see that in this log function we have a product of different zeros and a product of different poles multiplied by a gain. A very useful property of a log function is that the log of a times b is equal to log of a plus log of b. We know that a log of a over b is log of a minus log of b. This has major implications because now we can split this product of pole zeros and gains into individual lines on the Bode plot and simply add them up. In this case here we have 20 log of a constant times zeros times poles. This means that this transfer function in a log scale can be written as 20 log of k, that is the gain, plus individual lines that represent each one zero of the system, plus another element where each element represents the magnitude of individual poles. In conclusion, because of this property of the log function, if we know the Bode plot of basic function, we can sketch the Bode plot of the function g of s. This makes our job a lot easier. All we need to know now is to define these building blocks for Bode plots, that is, the Bode plot of a gain, the Bode plot of zeros, and the Bode plot of poles. We create individual Bode plots for these individual building blocks, and the Bode plot of the entire function is simply the sum of them. And for the phase, we have something very similar. Given the same transfer function again, we know that the phase of the transfer function is the inverse tangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part of that transfer function. It turns out that this function can also be expressed as a sum, and this sum will be the sum of angle of everything that is in the numerator of the transfer function, so that is the phase of the gain and the phase of zeros added together, plus the phase of the part that represents the poles, or minus the phase of the poles of the transfer function. These two representations are the same. When we now add all these components together, we get the phase of the entire transfer function. With that in mind, we can now define the building blocks to build more complex Bode plots. The first and most simple building block for Bode plots is a constant gain. In a constant gain, we simply have the gain k, which means that the real part is k and the imaginary part is zero. And this holds for all frequencies. We can now place these values on the s-plane. If k is positive, k lies on the positive real axis, and if k is negative, it lies on the negative real axis. But the magnitude of this particular building block is always k, that is this distance and this distance. The magnitude thus is 20 log of k for all frequencies. What is the phase of k? The phase of k is either zero, when k lies on the positive real axis, remember that the phase is this angle, when the imaginary part is zero, this angle goes to zero, or if k goes to 180 degrees, then this angle increases up to 180 degrees. Mathematically, we can define the angle as the inverse tangent of the imaginary part, zero, divided by the real part, k, and this is zero for all omega, provided that k is positive, or 180 degrees, negative 180 degrees, doesn't matter, if k is smaller than zero. On the Bode plot, this simply represents two straight lines. One straight line for the gain and one straight line for the phase. The next building block is a pole at the origin. If you have a pole at the origin, the transfer function for a pole at the origin is simply 1 over s. If you now replace s with j omega, we have 1 over j omega. The magnitude of this transfer function is simply 1 over omega. If you now take 20 log of 1 over omega, we get 20 log of 1 minus 20 log of omega. 20 log of 1 is 0, and you are left with negative 20 log of omega. If you now look at the phase of our transfer function, again our function is 1 over j omega. We can now multiply both the numerator and the denominator by j, and this gives 1 times j, that is j, 
divided by omega and j times j is negative 1, so this is negative j over omega. The real part is 0, the imaginary part is negative 1 over omega. We can now take these and plot that on the s-plane. We see the real part is 0 and the imaginary part is here. Clearly this angle is always negative 90 degrees. We could also do that mathematically, that is the inverse tangent of the imaginary part, negative 1 over omega, divided by the real part, which is 0, so let's call this a constant c, and make c tend to 0, this gives negative 90 degrees. It is easier to see on the plot that the angle is always negative 90 degrees. The phase of that pole is always 90 degrees, this results in this constant line for the phase part. What happens to the magnitude? The magnitude now has negative 20 log of omega. If we are at omega equals to 1, then we have negative 20 log of 1 radians per second, that is 0. If now the frequency increases by a factor of 10, and you go from 1 radians per second to 10 radians per second, we have negative 20 log of 10, log of 10 is 1, the frequency, the magnitude becomes negative 20 decibels. If you now go on to 100 radians per second, an increase of 10 on the frequency, we have negative 20 log of 100, log of 100 is 2, negative 2 times 2 is negative 40 decibels. When the frequency increases by a factor of 10, we are going to call that a decade. The frequency increases by 1 decade, the Bode plot goes down by 20 decibels. Thus, in a pole at the origin, we will have a constant slope of negative 20 decibels per decade. The next building block is the zero at the origin. The zero at the origin is a lot easier. Our transfer function is simply g of s equals to s. When you replace s with j omega, we have g of s equals to j omega. The imaginary part is omega, the real part is zero. Clearly, the magnitude of our transfer function is zero is squared plus omega squared, which is omega. In log scale, that is 20 log of omega. If you now take this information and plot that on the s-plane, we see, we see that the magnitude here is omega, not 1 over omega, as was shown before. The real part being 0, we have the magnitude of our transfer function here, that is simply omega, or 20 log of omega in log scale, and this angle is clearly 90 degrees. So for a 0 of the origin, the phase now becomes 90 degrees for all frequencies, and if you recall, for the pole at the origin, the magnitude was negative 20 log of omega. Now for the 0 at the origin, we have plus 20 log of omega. This means that now if the frequency increases by a factor of 10, the magnitude in the Bode plot will increase by a factor of 20. And you now have a positive slope of 20 decibels per frequency decade. Every time the frequency increases by a factor of 10, the Bode plot goes up by 20. We can clearly see it here. If you go from a frequency of 10 to the power of negative 1, there is 0.1 radians per second to a frequency of 10 to the power of 0, which is 1 radians per second, this is a factor of 10. And the magnitude went from negative 20 dB to 0. We move on by a factor of 10, the Bode plot goes up by 20 decibels. The slope is 20 decibels per decade. From this analysis, we can clearly see that the 0 is the inverted version of the pole. The pole has a phase of negative 90 degrees, the zero has a phase of positive 90 degrees. The slope of the zero is positive 20 decibels per decade, the slope of the pole is negative 20 decibels per decade. If now we have multiple zeros or multiple poles at the origin, each of them will add negative 90 degrees or positive 90 degrees and positive or negative 20 decibels per decade. Let's consider the case of multiple zeros at the origin, that is easier to see. If g of s equals to s to the power of n, and in fact, this is not even restricted to only zeros. If n is positive, then you have a zero, and if n is negative, we have a pole. The magnitude of the... We can now replace s with j omega, and evaluate the magnitude of this transfer function, which clearly is simply omega to the power of n. We can now take 20 log of omega to the power of n, and according to another property of the log function, if you have log of a to the power of b, this is equivalent to b log of a. 
this means that we can rewrite our expression as 20 times n log of omega. If you have three zeros, the slope becomes 60 decibels per decade. If you have one pole, then n equals to negative 1, the slope is negative 20 decibels per decade. If you have two poles, n is negative 2, we have negative 40 decibels per decade, and so on. And the same will apply to the phase. Each pole or each zero will add 90 degrees. So the phase will be n times 90 degrees. And this is represented here. For a single zero, the phase is 90 degrees. For two zeros at the origin, the phase is 180 degrees. For one pole at the origin, the phase is negative 90 degrees. For two poles at the origin, the phase is negative 180 degrees. Now let's do one exercise. To do this one, let's go to the light board. In this example, we are looking for the Bode plot of the function g of s equals to 10 over s squared. The Bode plot will display the magnitude and the phase of g of s when s is equal to j omega. Omega being the frequency that we are going to limit here to 10 to the power of negative 2 to 10 to the power of 2 radians per second. The magnitude will be shown in decibels, that is 20 log of 10 over s squared. This can be written as 20 log of 10 plus 20 log of 1 over s plus 20 log of 1 over s. And this is equal to 20 log of 10 plus 40 log of 1 over s. Because of this log property, that we can split this multiplication into sums, we can now use this building blocks to start the Bode plot, first represent the Bode plot of a constant gain, then take the Bode plot of 1 over s, a pole at the origin, and simply add them together to get the Bode plot of g of s. Or we could instead use these three elements here, but the two of them are equal. We see that we have 20 log of 1 over s, squared which is 20 log of 1 which is equivalent to 20 log of 1 over s plus 20 log of 1 over s or 40 log of 1 over s let's just start with the constant gain 20 log of 10 log of 10 is 20 this gives simply 20 and this is for all frequencies so 20 decibels for all frequencies is simply a straight line that represents that a constant gain here The next element is 40 log of 1 over s. There is two poles at the origin. A single pole at the origin would result in a line that decays by 20 decibels per decade. That is, every time you multiply the frequency here by a factor of 10, the Bode plot would go down by 20 decibels. But here, because you have two poles at the origin, and because of this property that we have here, we can see that now this slope becomes simply 40 decibels per decade. Let's start where the frequency is 1 radians per second, that is 10 to the power of 0. At 1 radians per second, 40 log of 1 is simply 0, so that would result in a point right here, 0 dB. If you now increase the frequency by a factor of 10, that is now we go to 10 to the power of 1, then the magnitude needs to decay by 40 decibels. So the magnitude at 1 radians per second is negative 40 dB. If we now go the other way, we go back to 10 to the power of negative 1, there is 0 0.1 radians per second. Compared to 0, the magnitude now increases by 40 decibels. So here we are at 0, we go back by a factor of 10 in the frequency, and the slope now goes up by 40 decibels. So at 10 to the power of 1, it should be at 40 decibels. And if you go now to 10 to the power of negative 2, there is again a factor of 10 compared to the previous frequency. So at 10 to the power of negative 1, we are at positive 80 decibels. And here we have the slope that decays by 40 decibels per decade. That is, every time the frequency increases by a factor of 10, the Bode plot goes down by a factor of 40 decibels. And every time you now decrease the frequency by a factor of 10, the Bode plot goes up by 40 decibels. And here you have the curve for 1 over s squared and the curve for 10. What would be the frequency at 10 to the power of 2? Well, if the 10 to the power of 1, we are at negative 40 dB. At 10 to the power of 2, 
this curve should be at negative 80 decibels. So these are the two building blocks that are coming from this equation. What is the final Bode plot for the function g of s? Because of this log property here that allowed us to split the to split the 20 log of 10 over s squared into two components and write them individually, now we can simply add them up according to this expression here, and the addition is now the Bode plot of g of s. So let's do that. Let's start with 10 to the power of 0. At 1 radians per second, this curve is at 0 decibels and this curve is at 20 decibels. So at 1 radians per second, 0 plus 20 is 20 decibels. At 10 to the power of 1, we are at negative 40 plus 20, that is negative 20 decibels, so around here. At 10 to the power of 2, we would be a negative 80 dB plus 20, that it would be negative 60. Still out of range, we should be around here, negative 60. Going to 10 to the power of negative 1, we have 20 plus 40, that is 60. Around here. And 10 to the power of negative 2, 20 plus 80, that is 100 dB should be around there. And this is now the Bode plot for the function g of s. We simply have the Bode plot of 1 over s squared that is shifted up by 20 decibels that comes from this gain of 10 in the transfer function. Now what is the phase for this transfer function? We simply have two poles at the origin. So we know that the phase is negative 180 degrees. Well, let's calculate that. We have two elements. We have the phase on the denominator and the phase in the denominator. The phase of this transfer function would be the arc tangent of this part here, the real part 0 divided by the imaginary part 10, minus now the phase of the poles. The phase of the pole, if you now replace s with j omega, we have two poles. We have the arc tangent of imaginary part, which is omega divided by the real part zero, minus the arc tangent of the second pole, same omega divided by zero. Now we can plot these two values here. It starts with the constant gain. We have a magnitude of 10 in the real part, and we have a magnitude of zero in the imaginary part. So the angle here is the angle between this line and the real axis, zero. Now let's do the poles at the origin. For the poles at the origin, we have a magnitude on the imaginary axis of omega and a magnitude on the real axis of zero. So the angle is here, and this is 90 degrees. But because these are poles, we have a negative sign, so we have negative 90 degrees for each. And this is negative 180 degrees for all frequencies. If you now go to the body plot and plot the phase, this is simply a constant. A constant value of negative 180 degrees. For all frequencies. Now that we have covered poles and zeros at the origin, we can add another building block to our library. This is the pole on the real axis, there is a real pole. We will define a real pole as shown here, 1 over s divided by omega 0 plus 1. Notice that you are not writing 1 over s plus omega 0, because the gain of this function when s tends to 0 would be 1 over omega 0. Here we want to isolate the effect of the real pole without any gain. So for now on, the standard form for Bode plot will be s over omega 0 plus 1. Omega 0 here will be called the cutoff frequency of this pole. If you now take your transfer function and replace s with j omega, we have this. We have 1 over j times the frequency that we are going to change manually and omega 0, which is the cutoff frequency associated with that pole. Omega zero is a fixed constant. 
The math gets a bit intimidating from now on, but you'll see that this is very simple. I'm going to skip all the steps here because this is basic calculus of complex variable. It is a good practice though to try to derive these equations on your own, so you get used to this formulation. If you wish to eliminate the complex part in the denominator, we can simply multiply the original function by the conjugate of the denominator. So this operation here is simply multiplying the function by 1, which does not affect the function at all. We can now expand this formulation and you have two terms. We can now clearly see that this formulation allows us to create two terms, the real part and the imaginary part. So we have 1 times the imaginary part, here is the imaginary part, plus 1 times 1, which gives the real part there. In the denominator, we see that the denominator now writes in the form of a plus b times a minus b, which is a squared minus b squared. In this case, a is 1 and b is j times omega divided by omega 0 is squared. So this is 1 minus j squared is negative 1, which gives 1 plus omega over omega 0 is squared. This is what you see in the denominator there. So here we have now clearly the real the imaginary part of the transfer function. We can now find the magnitude by doing the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. Notice that the imaginary part squared is this, is not j times that. j indicates the imaginary part. If you now expand this formulation and simplify it, we can get it down to this simple formula. I'm going to skip those steps, but again, if you wish to expand this function and derive this formula on your own, it is relatively simple to do. So after some simple manipulation, this is now the magnitude of our transfer function, 1 over omega squared divided by omega 0 squared plus 1. Remember again that omega 0 gives the position of the pole, this is called the cutoff frequency, and omega is the frequency of, is the input frequency to the system. So to recall, we have our transfer function now has one pole on the real axis, a real pole. This is now the same function expressed as a function of j omega and we determined the magnitude to be as shown. In decibels, we can now take 20 log of this function. Also remember that a log of a to the power of n is equal to n times log of a. So this negative 1 can now make it to the front of the equation. Here it is. And then we use the 1 half to draw the square root, which allows the magnitude of the transfer function to be written as follows, negative 20 log of a square root of omega squared divided by the cutoff frequency squared, all plus 1. If you want to determine the phase, we can now go back to the previous slide, take the, the real and imaginary part, and do the inverse tangent of the imaginary part, here it is, times its sine, divided by the real part. And again, using simple math, this would simplify to what we see here. You can try to do this step on your own, it is relatively simple. So finally, we have the magnitude and the phase of the transfer function that has a real pole. Now let's evaluate that transfer function. Here we again have the phase and the magnitude. Now the analysis here is a bit more complicated. We need to consider three cases. The first case is where the frequency that we are applying to the system is much smaller than the characteristic cutoff frequency of that pole. The frequency we are applying is omega and the cutoff frequency is omega zero. If we assume that we are applying a frequency that is much lower than the cutoff frequency of the system, then this term tends to zero. When that term tends to zero, we are left with negative 20 log of 1, which is zero decibels. Now let's plot this on the Bode plot. We have our cutoff frequency here, omega zero, and now if we are applying a frequency to the system that is lower than omega zero, the gain of the system will be zero decibels. What is the phase? If you look at the phase here, we are making the assumption that omega zero, that omega is much smaller than omega zero, so this will also tend to zero. Tangent minus one zero will give zero. So the phase is also zero up to the cutoff frequency omega zero. Now let's evaluate the second case where the frequency of excitation is exactly the cutoff frequency. If omega and omega zero are the same, then this term is equal to one, and we are left with negative 20 log of square root of two. This is equal to negative 3 decibels. So at the cutoff frequency, the Bode plot is now at negative 3 dB. What is the phase? We can also look here, and if omega and omega 0 are the same, then you have tangent minus 1 of 1, of negative 1, which is negative 45 degrees. So at the cutoff frequency, the magnitude of the phase 
goes to negative 45 degrees. Finally, we can evaluate the third case. Now in the third case, the excitation frequency to the system is much greater than its cutoff frequency. That is, omega is much greater than omega zero. If this is the case, what happens to this term? This term, if omega is much greater than omega zero, then this term will be much greater than one, and you can neglect the effect of one. This can simplify to negative 20 log of omega squared divided by omega zero squared, which means that this simplifies to negative 20 log of square root of omega squared over omega zero squared, which is negative 20 log of omega divided by omega zero. If we now pick random points of omega, we'll notice that every time we increase omega by a factor of 10 compared to omega zero, the magnitude will go down by negative 20 decibels. If the magnitude of omega is 10 times omega zero, this is negative 20. If the magnitude of omega is 100 times that of omega zero, this is negative 40, and so on. Every time we increase the frequency by a factor of 10 with respect to the cutoff frequency, the Bode plot goes down by negative 20 decibels. This means that past the cutoff frequency, the Bode plot has a constant slope of negative 20 decibels per decade with respect to the cutoff frequency. So now the Bode plot decays at a rate of negative 20 decibels per frequency decade. What happens to the phase? The phase in case 3, we are assuming that omega is much greater than omega zero. So this term tends to negative infinity and the tangent now converges to negative 90 degrees. So past the cutoff frequency, the phase now goes to negative 90 degrees. Now let me erase this and let's try to summarize this discussion. Here we have omega zero, the cutoff frequency. Up to the cutoff frequency, up to the cutoff frequency, the magnitude of the Bode plot is zero. At the cutoff frequency, the magnitude of the Bode plot is negative three decibels. Past the cutoff frequency, the magnitude decays at a rate of negative 20 decibels per frequency decayed. If we now put everything together, the magnitude should look like this where this particular point is negative 3 dB and this is negative 20 decibels per decade. The phase goes from 0 degrees to 45 degrees at the cutoff frequency to negative 90 degrees. If you now interpolate these values, we should see something like this. The width of this area is plus minus 5 times the cutoff frequency. So let's assume that our cutoff frequency in this case was 1 radians per second. When we are now at 10 radians per second, 10 times the original frequency, what is the magnitude of the Bode plot? Negative 20 dB. If you now go to 10 times that, we are at negative 40 dB, and so on. Here is another exercise. Now in this exercise, we're going to use a pole on the real axis. Let's go back to the light board and do it there. In this second example, the transfer function you're looking to draw the Bode plot for is 1 over s plus 0 0.1. Let's just start by writing this transfer function in the standard form we need for Bode plot. That is, we need s plus 1. This can be rewritten as 1 over, let's factor 0 0.1, this s over 0 0.1 plus 1, g of s equals to 10 over s over 0 0.1 plus 1. The body plot will show the 20 log of this function, 20 log of 10 over s over 0 0.1 plus 1 is equal to 20 log of 10 plus 20 log of 1 over s over 0 0.1 plus 1. This means that we can now split this body plot into two parts, into two building blocks, a constant gain and a real pole. Let's start with the constant gain. 20 log of 10 is 20, so that will give a constant value on the body plot for this part here of 20 decibels. And here it is. This is for 10, 20 decibels. This is always 10 for all frequencies. The second element that we have is 20 log of a real pole. And this pole is has and this pole has a cutoff frequency of 0 0.1 radius per second that is 10 to the power of 1 right here. We know that for a real pole up to the cutoff frequency the magnitude of the body plot is 0 
and past the cutoff frequency, the Bode plot starts to decay by a factor of 20 decibels per decade. The cutoff frequency is 0.1, that is 10 to the power of 1. So from any frequency below the cutoff frequency, the gain is 0. At the cutoff frequency specifically, the gain is negative 3 decibels, which so starts to decay. And past the cutoff frequency, now it goes down by a factor of 20 decibels per decade. So at 10 to the power of 1, we should be roughly at around negative 20 dB. And at 10 to the power of 1, we should be at negative 40 dB, roughly. Notice that here, at the cutoff frequency, the gain is negative 3 decibels. So here, we should be at a 20 decibels, which is this distance. We went, we increased the frequency by a factor of 10. The Bode plot decreases by a factor of 20, hence negative 20 decibels, minus that 3. So here we should be at around 23 dB, if we account for this negative 3 decibels. And this is coming from 1 over s over 0 0.1 plus 1. Now, what is the Bode plot of the combined function? These two elements added together, basically. So this curve plus that curve. We can now simply add them together from 10 to the power of negative 2 to 10 to the power of negative 1. We have 0 plus 20, so that's going to be always 20. At 10 to the power of negative 1, which is the cutoff frequency, we have negative 3 plus 20, so we are around negative 17 dB. And now the Bode plot will go down by 20 decibels per decade. At 10, we were at negative 23. Negative 23 plus 20 is around negative 3 dB, so it should be around here. At 10 to the power of negative 1, now we go down by, so this is negative 3 dB. We go down by another 20 dB, so we go down to negative 23. And at 10 to the power of negative 2, we should be roughly at negative 43. So this curve here is the curve for 1 over s over 0 0.1 plus 1. And this curve here is this plus 10, which gives g of s the original function. Again, here we are considering this negative 3 dB that occurs exactly at the cutoff frequency for a real pole. But if you disregard this, just to make a simpler analysis, from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 1, we are at 0. Past 10 to the minus 1, it goes down by 20 decibels per decade. So here we should be at 20 minus 20, 0. 0 minus 20 minus 20 here, because we increase the frequency by a factor of 10. And you increase this frequency again by a factor of 10, we go down by another 20 decibels, that is negative 40 dB. Because we consider this negative 3 dB here at the cutoff frequency, then everything is further shifted down by 3 decibels. Now, what is the phase? For the phase, we can look at a constant gain. The phase for a constant gain is always zero. And the phase for a real pole goes from zero to negative 90 degrees at the cutoff frequency. So before the cutoff frequency, the phase is zero. At the cutoff frequency, it will shift to negative 90 degrees and it will stay at negative 90 degrees. Now we can interpolate this curve. And you know that this curve will go like this tending to negative 90 degrees, and you pass at negative 45 degrees at the cutoff frequency, and this is now the phase for the function g of s. The next building block they are going to consider in this lecture is the zero on the real axis, or a real zero. For a real zero, the transfer function can be expressed as follows, s over omega zero plus one, where again omega zero is the cutoff frequency of that zero, and determines where the zero is. We can now replace s with j omega and we have following expression. After this manipulation, we can already see here the real and imaginary part. We can now take the square root of the imaginary part plus the real part squared and take 20 log of that. And here we have already the magnitude of our transfer function without the need for any further manipulation. 
Now if we go back to the slide where we discussed the pole on the real axis, you see that expression 19 is exactly the same except that it doesn't have the negative sign in front of it. This is exactly the same as the real pole with the exception now that the slope is positive. Taking this expression we can also find the phase of the transfer function which is the inverse tangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part. Recall that for the phase for real pole this was negative omega divided by omega n. For both phases of the magnitude, now we have the negative of the pole of the origin. The analysis is a lot simpler. The real zero is the negative of a real pole on the Bode plot. This means that if we place this on the Bode plot, the magnitude is zero up to the cutoff frequency the same way the pole was. At the cutoff frequency, now the magnitude is plus 3 dB. And past the cutoff frequency, now the slope goes up by 20 decibels per decade. The phase goes from 0 to 45 degrees and then 90 degrees, which the same interpolation like that. So let's consider this example. We have a real zero and a real pole. They both have a cutoff frequency of 5 radians per second, which is located around here. We see that for the pole, up to 5 radians per second, the magnitude is constant and then goes down past 5 radians per second. It goes down by negative 20 dB per decade. At 5, it should be negative 3 decibels. For the zero, we see that now the zero has the same behavior except that at the cutoff frequency, the magnitude is plus 3 decibels and past the cutoff frequency, now it goes up by 20 decibels per decade. Looking at the phase, we see that the phase goes from zero to negative 90 degrees for the pole and from zero to plus 90 degrees for the zero. You may be wondering, well, this is not really zero when the frequency is lower than the cutoff frequency. What is this shift here? Well, this shift comes from the fact that there is a gain in the transfer function that you have to account for. This one here can be written as h of s equals to 1 over 5 divided by 1 over s plus 5 plus 1. Now we have two elements to consider. We have the Bode plot of a pole, which would indeed start at 0 and then go down like that. But also we have a gain of 1 over 5, 20 log of 1 over 5 is negative 0.6 dB. So everything shifts down by 0.6 dB. That's why it's not 0, it's negative 0.6. If you now look at the 0, we also need to prepare the 0 in the standard form. So this would be 5 over 5 s over 5 plus 1. Now we have here a gain of 5. 20 log of 5 is positive 0.6 decibels and that's why the zero plot is shifted up everywhere by 0 0.6 decibels, 0 0.69 to be precise. But again, if we didn't have these gains and we had both functions expressed without any gains, such as, such as follows, then both plots would look like this and the phase would be exactly the same. Now there is a few more exercises in this lecture. Body plots is one of the most complicated topics. I recommend you attempt all of them and watch all the videos provided in this lecture. In the next lecture, we are going to complicate things a little bit more because we are going to include our next building block that we haven't addressed here, which is the complex zeros and complex poles. So before we attempt that, it is very important that the concepts covered in this lecture are very clear. Thank you.